Um, what's your favorite uh, case that you've ever defended? <laughs> well, um, there's probably I can't. There's probably three or four of them at the top. Civilly, that case I just talked about was right. about by far my favorite. Although there are a couple criminal, I was <clears throat> I defended along with Barry Voss the Jordan sex ring. I didn't do it. The latest two suspects to make court appearances today, Lois and Robert Benz, both denied molesting their own children or any others. I'm innocent. When Robert and Lois Benz were arrested last week, their three children were removed from their house and placed in foster homes. Ironically, just four days before he was arrested, Robert Benz was one of 25 angry Jordan residents who showed up for a city council meeting. They were upset about the negative publicity the town has received in recent months. Others charged that county attorney Kathleen Morris is on a witch hunt. Kathleen Morris, the prosecutor, had charged, I can't remember how many people now. And I was, uh, at the time, I figured I had a pretty good case and I did not want anybody to try their case first. I wanted to do it. So, because if one person got convicted, and I think there were 20 people and the allegations were that these neighbors would get together and then their kids would go play hide and seek and then the neighbor would go find a kid not theirs and sexually assault him oh dear that god was, yeah that was one of the allegations <laughs> and there were many more morris handles the notoriety and the media well she's easy to talk with she can be charming ask her why she's so interested in the sexual abuse of children she has an uncomplicated answer. Well, I don't know that I'm so interested, you know. I. It's just another way people hurt people. And I don't like to see people get hurt. I wish I, I, wish I had a good story. It seems like people always have good stories, you know. No, I wasn't sexually abused. I wasn't physically abused. I didn't meet one kid that stands out in my mind more than any other. Kathleen Morris spends a lot of time on these cases. Her critics say she's gotten carried away. Some of the town folks say she's on a witch hunt. Morris denies both. I'm not any more obsessed with it than I am with doing a good job in this office, whether it's the burglaries or the worthless checks or the homicides uh, or the fence law. Are you telling uh, me those cases mean as much to you as these sexual abuse cases? I, yeah. I, Have you ever been wrong? Yeah, oh, my gosh. Accusing a parent wrongly. Or a relative or an adult wrongly of abusing each other? No. No. If she sounds too good to be true, Morris is quick to describe her flaws. She says she is selfish, shy, and nervous to the point that she gets nauseous every time she's about to go into court. Kathleen is well aware that some people fault her motives. So most of the time is, uh, I'm political. Uh, who do I want to go? What do I want to be? Uh, I, and that's why I'm doing this. I asked Kathleen Morris about her political ambitions six times during this interview. Each time she was vague. I think one thing that we tend to be sure of is we can look forward to Kathleen Morris continuing with vigorous prosecution and investigations down of child sexual abuse, criminal sexual abuse cases involving children in Scott County. I'm very deep, lady. And my client was uh, who's deceased. Uh, the the charge, the case actually killed him, I believe. <clears throat> My client, great guy, worked for the Ford plant. I worked at the Ford plant when I was in school. But, um, you know, no, no way in hell would he ever do that. He had two boys or three, I can't remember. So, uh, and there's something wrong here. Well, anyway, we get into the case, and this prosecutor totally, totally had uh, violated every rule there could possibly be in interviewing children and giving them treats storing them all together during the trial. We finally oh. just, it, it, it went on for a month. Robert and Lois Benz and I taking part in games of hide and seek where according to criminal complaints, children who were caught by adults were forced into performing sex acts. The Benz's attorney charged today that the children are only repeating what authorities have told them to say. You don't need to brainwash a child, you just show him some attention. And if, the, if the child gets more attention based on and the more he says, uh, you can bet that that child will tell stories and stories and stories. 
In a separate matter, prosecutor Kathleen Morris moved to close the trial to reporters when children testify. I believe it's easier for children to tell real heinous, terrible things that have happened to them with the least amount of people possible. But defense attorneys opposed the closing. The public has a right to know. Up until now, nobody's been yet. Given the story of my client or the other parents in this case that have had their children taken from them. Meanwhile, Judge Martin Mansa ruled the public and media will be barred from the courtroom when the alleged victims testify. Defense attorneys had hoped to keep the trial open, arguing the children have been badgered into making the sex allegation. The children involved in this case, I think it's sort of a fallacy to say that they will have an easier time telling the truth if they close courtroom. I think that they have a easier time telling lies too with a closed courtroom. Opening statements in the trial began in the afternoon. Scott County Attorney Kathleen Morris began the state's case with a key witness, James Rude. Rude became a state's witness a few weeks ago in exchange for his guilty plea on 10 counts. The state dropped 98 other charges against him. He'll be sentenced later. He was whisked from the Scott County Jail where he's been in custody since September of 83. He said that he saw Bob and Lois Bentz at a sex party last August. However, when asked to identify the Bentzes, he could only point out Lois Bentz, who was the only woman other than Kathleen Morris seated at a table in the courtroom. He said he did not recognize Bob Bentz, which resulted in Judge Mansour ruling that Root could not use Bob Bentz's name in testimony. But when he mentioned other adults who were at that party, Bob Benz's attorney, Earl Gray, objected. My client has not been charged with other crimes. He's charged with the crimes in a complaint. And she's trying to bring in crimes of other people that he wasn't even present at. And the people aren't even charged. It's pretty scary. But it was clear from the first smile seen on Bob and Lois Benz in court, and from defense attorney Gray, they were pleased with the first day of testimony. You know, things went all right today. We haven't gotten anywhere. I mean, so what have we brought in so far? We have one pervert on the stand. The only one. The judge in the child sex abuse trial at Chaska threw out half the charges against Robert and Lois Benz. Pat Myler, he has been covering this for us. Joins us from the newsroom right now with more on the courtroom developments today. Pat? Cindy and Dennis, 24 of the 48 charges involving five children were thrown out because Judge Martin Mansour said the prosecution had not presented enough evidence for the charges to even be presented to the jury. The charges dropped affect three kids who were basically neighbors of the Benz's. The other two dropped were incest charges involving two of the Benz's three sons. Prosecutor Kathleen Morris is now left with only half of her case. On beginning the defense today, attorney Earl Gray told the jury that the story they'll present is not one of child sex abuse, but abuse of power by Scott County and prosecutor Kathleen Morris. Gray says a doctor will take the stand and testify that Scott County used a tactic similar to Red China during the Korean War in brainwashing the children. The defense also plans to bring forward a doctor who will testify that one of the girls who swore she was raped shows no physical signs of any such contact. The defense says they'll be able to prove the children were only repeating on the witness stand what they were told to say by investigators and the county attorney. There was one other significant development this morning. Last week it was revealed in court that the six child witnesses who testified on behalf of the state were staying together at a nearby hotel where they played, ate dinner, and discussed their testimony together. The witnesses were supposed to be sequestered or kept away from one another, but from the bench this morning, Judge Martin Mansour chastised Prosecutor Morris for putting the children together and said, quote now, an appropriate sanction will be imposed on Morris at the end of the trial. So they had yesterday an 11-year-old boy testified that Lois and Bob Benz had sexually abused him in several different ways. But under intense grilling today by defense attorneys, the fifth grader retracted most, but not all, of that testimony. Question, so you lied yesterday? Answer, yes. Question, was that a big lie or a little lie? Answer, a big lie. The court had to be recessed for a while this afternoon when the couple's 10-year-old son began sobbing when pressed by the defense for details of alleged sexual activities. The boy admitted that he had denied for seven months that his parents abused him, only changing his story last month after he learned that his brother had made similar charges. The defense also tried to get the youngster to admit that he changed the story after repeated prompting and pressure by prosecutors. Question. Do you think you're helping your dad by saying he violated you? Answer. Yeah, because he won't have to go to jail for so long. Meanwhile, Prosecutor Kathleen Morris went to court all smiles today, quickly lost the smile. When Judge Manser scolded her for what he said was a violation of his order to keep witnesses from comparing testimony. All the youngsters who testified stayed at the same hotel together prior to taking the stand. 
Lawrence claimed she did it for the protection of the children, but defense attorneys called the children's testimony tainted and poisoned and called Morris's actions outrageous. Judge Mansur did not agree the children influenced each other's testimony, but he did scold Morris, saying, the prosecution's action demonstrates lack of judgment and disregard for this order. And the judge promised to punish Morris at the conclusion of the trial. Then, with half as many charges against the Benses as when the trial began, the defense began its case. Quickly, they targeted prosecutor Kathleen Morris. Defense attorney Earl Gray saying the story is not one of sexual abuse, but abuse of power by Scott County authorities and Kathleen Morris. Speaking to the jury, Gray suggested the Benses were being prosecuted because they spoke out at a Jordan City Council meeting about the sex ring investigation. And Gray says tomorrow, psychologists will testify that the children were brainwashed. In interrogation procedure, uh, years on these children who testified is similar to the brainwashing or thought method uh, in Red China. Defense attorneys spent the day calling Morris's investigators as witnesses for Bob and Lois Benz. Heated exchanges between defense attorney Earl Gray and two of the case investigators revealed that at least three of the children either lied or were mistaken when they testified last week. In at least three instances, Gray managed to point out testimony from the little girls about sex acts performed on them by the Benses that appear nowhere in any police report. Prosecutor Morris said little and rarely took the opportunity for cross-examination. Attorney Gray pushed hard as the jury listened to policemen say what the children testified to was not true and that some of the sex acts they were told about in court were not in any police report. Gray believes the testimony shows that the children's stories are just incredible tales that are not to be believed. On another point, defense attorney Earl Gray argued the bench children were snatched from their home based on false allegations from two children. Outside court, Gray criticized Scott County authorities for what he calls casually removing children from a home without first doing a complete investigation. In the same afternoon that these false claims were made, they were out there taking the children from the home and also arresting my client and his wife. In fact, they took the children from the home when my client and his wife were at work. The entire day was spent questioning two psychologists. Dr. Kenneth Perkins, a clinical psychologist, said a battery of seven tests performed on the couple showed above-average IQs. Perkins called the Benses bright, normal people, adding that in his hours of testing and questioning, not once was there anything that indicated they were sexual deviants. One of the tests was a sentence completion examination, where the defendants were given a phrase and asked to make it a complete sentence. Those 43 sentences read aloud in court revealed what the psychologist called the couple's frustration, anger, and worry about the sex ring charges. After the words, I failed, Robert Bentz wrote, to see that even though I did nothing wrong, I can be arrested. After the words, I hate, Bentz wrote, people who would use children to make a name for themselves. He was obviously referring to the case prosecutor Kathleen Morris has built around the highly publicized sex ring arrest. During a break in the testimony, the clinical psychologist who tested the Benses talked with reporters about his conclusions. Basically, that they impressed in the testing and my impressions as generally normal, average kinds of folks. Not the sexual deviants that have been pointed out in criminal complaints and charges in this trial. Not my impression at all. A second psychologist was also called by the defense today to establish that alleged child victims were led by authorities into making accusations against adults. Dr. Ralph Underwater said techniques used by therapists and investigators in this case on children were identical to brainwashing procedures used by the Red Chinese in the Korean War. The Benz's testimony lasted just over an hour. Attorneys for the couple questioned them only briefly and rested their case before 11 this morning. Defense attorney Earl Gray asked Bob Benz to describe his children. Benz did so, emphasizing the honesty of his three young boys. Then attorney Gray repeated the charges the youngsters and other children had made against the Benzes during the trial in graphic detail. To each charge, Bob Benz replied, No, I have never done that. No. Lois Benz echoed her husband's denials. As his attorney listed off the names of children and the sex acts purportedly performed upon them by Benz, the father of three said no and never to questions about whether he ever touched any of the children sexually. The same denials came from Lois Benz minutes later on the witness stand. The Wisconsin native sobbed when she was asked about the status of her family 
and said she asked a priest to bless their Jordan home after their three sons were placed in a foster home because, quote now, it was so lonely without the kids there. It had such a different feeling about it. Prosecutor Kathleen Morris surprised most of the spectators when she declined questioning the defendants, who spent less than an hour on the witness stand. Good evening, everyone. Late this afternoon, the Robert and Lois Bent child rape case went to the jury. In closing arguments, the Benton's attorneys attacked the credibility of child witnesses, while the prosecution said that common sense will lead the jury to believe the children's testimony. Today, that jury saw one of the most emotional, heated, and sometimes brilliant courtroom formations you may ever see. The fireworks came when Earl Gray, defense attorney for Robert Benz, got his chance for closing arguments. Yeah. Gray called prosecutor Kathleen Morris, quote, a little god, a sixth person, whose thirst for ego, thirst for publicity, caused her to play with the facts of the case, orchestrate testimony. He added that the prosecutor, quote, now put those children, put those questions and answers in the kids' minds, saying, quote, if ever there was child abuse in this case, it was what these people did to those Benz kids. Add into the equation the bitter personal conflict between defense attorney Earl Gray and Scott County attorney Kathleen Morris. During his closing arguments yesterday, Gray accused Morris of concocting evidence and orchestrating testimony. He described Morris as a sick person and a little god who has abused her powers as county attorney. Defense attorney Earl Gray said of Morris at one point, quote, that's a sick person we're dealing with, that of the prosecutor Kathleen Morris. Defense attorney Earl Gray charged Morris conducted a sloppy investigation, brought charges to satisfy her ego, and pointing a finger at her, said, quote, that's a sick person we're dealing with. And defense attorney Gray attempted to portray the prosecutor, Kathleen Morris, as the real issue in this case, calling Morris a sick person. Gray said she's the one that put these questions and these answers in the children's mind. If there was ever child abuse committed in this case, it was what these people did, he said, referring to the prosecution. Gray systematically attacked the credibility of the child witnesses, saying you can't have incredible, unreasonable testimony and say it's all right because children don't lie. The speculation here is that we may have a hung jury with two or three holding out against the majority. Lois Bent said the waiting is like sitting on top of a time bomb. They watched their attorneys play a light-hearted game of Frisbee, both Earl Gray and Barry Voss would like to have this case decided by this jury. They say they will be satisfied only by an acquittal on all counts. Barry Voss, who's no longer a lawyer, but was with me, and he was a young lawyer. He was a very good lawyer, I thought, very helpful. But most of it was on my shoulders. So at, at noon that last day, we decided that we're, we're screwed. It's going to be a hung jury. So we might as well start drinking. <laughs> uh, I uh, I got the photo in my office. If you're ever up in St. Paul, stop in and I'll show you. It's a it's a um, headline in the paper, the win. And I've got my arms over the father and the mother um, after the verdict. And you could tell if you knew me that I was a little bit inebriated. That was after the verdict. So. So you got, the, um, you got the glaze in the eyes a little well, bit. I, I had a smile on my face. So, <laughs> so the next day, uh, and Ronnie Meshbesher, who was another great criminal defense lawyer, was a good friend of mine. And the next day, he sends me a note. No emails in those days. Sends me a note, and he says, "Congratulations, Earl, for winning an acquittal." But hugging them—is that serious? Are you serious? Something like that. <laughs> he objected to me hugging them. So less than an hour ago, Robert and Lois Benz were found not guilty on 12 counts apiece of sexual abuse against children. The charges involved five children, including one of their sons. When the verdict was read in the Chaska County Courthouse, both Robert and Lois Benz broke into tears. The same was true for friends and relatives in the courtroom. Robert Benz attorney Earl Gray said, quote, It shows that in the USA, you don't convict innocent people. You can torture them, but you cannot convict them. Lois Benz started to wipe tears from her eyes. As one by one, the clerk began to read the counts against the Benzes. She repeated herself again and again, not guilty, on all 24 counts. Family members and friends inside the courtroom started to cheer openly as the verdict was announced. The defense attorney, Earl Gray, turned around at one point and hugged the defendants. The prosecutor, Kathleen Morris, sat motionless, almost expressionless throughout all of this. Let's take a look now at the emotional reaction inside the courthouse immediately after the verdict was announced. We would just like to say that it's...
shows in the United States of America that you don't convict innocent people. Right. And you bet. Right, Barry? Right. You can torture them, but you don't convict them. And these people have been tortured, let me tell you. Know, in this case, it's not surprising. If it is at all, it would be surprising that it took this long, but it's not surprising based on the evidence. We felt all along that we were right. We felt all along that our clients were not only not guilty, but they were innocent, innocent for these charges. And you're victimized by somebody in Scott County. And you're <laughs> glad the St. Mary was over. You're glad. I just want to get you back. Neither Lois nor Robert Benz could put into words what a relief it was to wake up clear to the rape charges this morning. But they say their troubles are not over. They expect they'll have to move out of Scott County. I think we will get harassed. When our kids get back in the school system, that's what we're really nervous about, is that the kids are going to pick on our kids. I mean, we can deal with it. We're adults. But, you know, we're, what are the children? We've got one that's going to have to go 11 years in the school system. It could have been anybody. No, it just happened. I guess we just happened to be living in, uh, in Jordan in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, this thing went down, and we were just got swept up in it. The former mayor of Jordan severely criticized County Prosecutor Kathleen Morris. A lot of us feel that she just isn't right in her head, really. And what has been done to those children, the, the abuse of those children by our county attorney and those that have gone along with her, is just unspeakable. You take any child out of a home for eight or a nine months, or an adult for nine months, and just work with them to a certain amount of people, and you will become programmed, and, and that's very obvious here. Robert and Lois Bentz stood trial and were acquitted, but they still cannot get their kids back. Oh, I was loving it. I still have my kids. I can't see my kids. I can see my oldest boy on Thursday. The other two I can't even have visitation with. Um, we've been acquitted on this, and I can't have visitation with them. You tell me why. I don't know why. You know, you can sit here and talk all day, and, but unless you went through it, you don't even know what the feeling is. The fences were charged with 12 counts each of criminal sexual conduct. During a four-week trial, the prosecution brought in five children, including one of the fences who testified against them. But the defense cited a number of irregularities in the investigation and contradictions in the children's statements. There was a pause in the courthouse after the jury returned its verdict, not guilty on all counts. It seemed to raise questions about the extent of child sexual abuse, and eventually led to questions about the conduct of the Scott County Attorney's Office. It began one year ago with the arrest of James Rhoda, a 27-year-old trash collector. He was charged with 108 counts of child sexual abuse. He quickly began implicating others, telling authorities there were two alleged child sex rings in the Jordan area. Eventually, 24 people were arrested based on statements from Rood and from children. Two months ago, Robert and Lois Bentz became the first of those charged to be tried. And a month later, Carver County jury found them not guilty of all charges. Scott County Attorney Kathleen Morris said she had become the focus of the defense case, and so she removed herself from the forthcoming trial of Donald and Cindy Buchanan. And today, as testimony was scheduled to begin in that trial, as we say, all charges were dismissed. So, of the 25 people originally charged, but one, James Rood, was found guilty when he plea bargained with authorities. Two others were acquitted, and today the remaining 22 had all charges against them dropped. <laughs> wow, that was, there were, uh, I think we had five children testify, and uh, I was demeaned and viciously attacked for um being tough on these kids I, I was on nightline at the time which was live nationally and everybody thought i was an asshole for cross-examining these children and then later on i think they realized that if a child's gonna lie you gotta get there some way to prove it joining us now from our affiliate kstp in minneapolis is lois benz who along with her husband was acquitted last month of sexually abusing one of her own and four other children in the only Jordan case to come to trial. Also with us is psychologist Michael Shea, who has treated some of the children and adults involved in the case. Attorney Earl Gray, who successfully defended Mr. Benz in the trial last month. 
and Dr. Carolyn Levitt, a pediatrician who also has examined several of the children who claim to have been abused. Dr. Levitt, let's start with you. There is an article today in the American Medical Association Journal and it says, so quoting some of the doctors who have talked to these children, that there are definite signs of sexual abuse. You have uh, treated and dealt with some of the children. Do you agree with that? I certainly do. I have treated only five of these children, but I've had extensive experience in evaluating and examining other children who have been sexually abused. And there are certainly problems sometimes in finding absolute objective evidence that children have been abused by their physical examination, and this has seemed to hamper people's testimony. However, children are able to tell you exactly what they experienced. There's no question in my mind that these children have been abused in the ones that I have seen and in other children that I've seen because of the way they make those statements. How do you tell the physical examination? Well, as a pediatrician, I've had at least 15 years in dealing with children. One of the things that I can tell in talking to a child, and I spend approximately an hour and a half with the child, is just looking at their emotional reaction, watching them as they struggle through trying to state what has happened to them. And the second thing you look for is for the data that they give you. They could have not have learned it in any other way. They describe very explicit sexual statements that could no way have been learned by somebody teaching them or prompting them what to say. They can tell you what comes out of a male penis. They can tell you what semen looks like. They can tell you who cleaned it up. They can tell you, in one case, the dog cleaned it up. I mean, these are questions that we've learned to ask. And if we ask the child, and then what happened next? You will always get an answer that, that is carrying you further and further into the documentation of what happened to that child. And, and we're talking about children of what ages? Well, I see mainly children who are three or four or five years old, and the reason for that is because they are the most difficult to document. So that some of the teenage kids are seeing other people or they're not necessarily having a physical examination. But I have had to use the uh, experience that I have gained in the past three years to try to uh, emphasize the statements that the children are making when they're making them initially. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing children who other people are uncomfortable talking to. I often will see them even before the, the uh, complete investigation is done. Maybe there's not been a county attorney or excuse me, a social worker that's even seen them yet if they're very young. They often will have me see them first just right. for that very reason. Mr. Gray, when you went to trial in this case, you were confronted with that kind of testimony. Psychologists who feel and doctors who feel that the testimony of the children is believable because they simply can't know these kinds of details. How did you confront that in court? First of all, you're wrong. I was not confronted with what uh, this lady testified, uh, stated just now. In my case, uh, the Benz's case, we in fact called the doctor who examined most of the children as a defense witness. And that doctor, I think it is the same doctor that wrote in the journal testified that he found no object he made no objective findings with respect to the children being violated in any way and um, I think only one child he did find an objective finding in and that child was a child that was uh, violated by this character named James Rudd I think it's unfair for this doctor to say what she just said that all of these children have been violated and she knows that just because of what they say she didn't make any physical findings, but because the child says this to her, I she knows it. Now, in I our think case, a semantic argument, however. Well, well, wait a minute. In our, in, our case, in our case, we call the doctors. In our case, we prove that they weren't violated, and we still don't have our children back. We are not even allowed to have our own doctors see the children. So what you have down in Scott County now that they, they dismissed all of the cases, you have a whitewash now by these doctors who are working for the county or getting contracted by the county, and the I parents, think the parents still think. suffer. The parents still haven't seen their children. My client Lois Benz or my client Bob Benz, they still can't see their children. And in fact, they were acquitted of all counts. Half of the counts the judge dismissed. I so think the doctors are that? not contracted with by the county and are not a uh, part of the county. They, we're individual. When they examine the children, they're paid by right, the well, county. Hold, hold we are, Mr. Gray, let, let, we let, are let Dr. paid Levitt for respond, a consultation please. that is done in any other type of specialty. If, if you have renal disease, you're seen for by a specialist in that field. And if you have a child who's been sexually abused, you're seen by a physician who has expertise in that area. Just we are billed for a consultation, and believe me, it's not anywhere near the time and effort that we put into this because they're so difficult to staff and pull together. So it's not a monetary thing that we are paid by the county to make statements well, across the board. And I think your argument is somewhat semantic. If you ask the doctor on the stand whether he had any objective evidence 
to confirm the sexual abuse. So I think what does the hymen mean? No, Mr. 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 Children can be abused without having their hymen even touched, let alone being in When a young girl testifies in open court in the government's case that she had sexual intercourse with my client on over five occasions, and I was specific, and she said that the penis was in the vagina, and the doctor says no. It could that, have... that I can understand very well oh, from my Greg, experience. Mr. Children Greg, do not know which orifice the penis may be going in. Well, Many sure children think that they have him. had penile vaginal penetration, and in fact they have not, because they don't know what you're talking about. Well, you and just said that. Let, 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 let me stop you for a moment. Let me stop you for a moment. Mr. Gray, let me ask you a specific question. Mr. Gray, please. Well, Let me ask you a specific question. Fine. You said you didn't have that kind of testimony, and yet you just talked about it. That's right. This is we testimony. Now, wait a minute. This is testimony from children who basically could not know these kinds of details and uh, the specific acts that are involved uh, unless they were involved in them. I think Dr. Levitt makes a good point. How does a child know well, unless it actually <laughs> happens? I, I think that you're wrong there. I think that if you would have seen the case that we went through, you would see that children testified and openly admitted that they knew this, uh, these facts, because they did it with their older brothers and their older sisters. They were left out in that country alone, and the one boy that had, that there was evidence that he was violated, his older brother, who was 17 years old, slept in his bed every night and violated him. So they know by the older children, it can't be the parents all the time, and she is wrong. She's dead wrong on that. Parents, there's not a group of 24 people in Jordan that violate children. It's absurd. There was one man, there was one man, and he testified, I want to get this across, he testified at trial that he had violated so many kids in that area, he couldn't count them. Dr. Shea, uh, you have been, as a psychologist, you have talked to some of these children as well. Do you agree with Dr. Levitt that the abuse has occurred in Jordan? I have no doubt that there's been extensive sexual abuse occurring in Jordan, Minnesota. And how do you determine that? You determine that in addition to the physical findings that the physicians may be able to produce in, in their reports, you do that by evaluations of the children, which include talking with the children and, and talking with them during play therapy and play sessions where they may, they may uh, relate their experiences uh, through their play, through psychological testing, through a review of, of, of records and interviews, through cross checking various uh, statements children have been making at various times and to various interviewers. And do you think there's a presumption of believability uh, with a child because, as Dr. Levitt says, they are so young and they could not know otherwise? Certainly children lie. Children may become confused. It would be foolish to say that children uh, never lie or that any time a child says there's abuse that, that it's definitely occurred. But generally children can be believable. They can be reliable witnesses. They generally are. Uh, children can fantasize, children may think about sex, may be stimulated by various sources, but when you have children talking very, about very graphic sexual acts, when they're talking about people who they have loved and continue to love, and they talk with great pain about things that have happened, in, in many of these cases they can be believed and they can give reliable testimony. All right, Dr. Shea, thank you. We will be back in a moment to continue our conversation and we will talk with Mrs. Benz one of the defendants in the only case that was tried in Jordan, and we'll be back in a moment. Continuing our conversation now involving the occurrences in Jordan, Minnesota. This is Lois Benz. You were acquitted in the trial that did take place, but as I understand it, your own children testified against you. Tell me why and uh, tell me about that. Uh, they did, but I believe they were brainwashed by uh, Scott County. By Scott County, what do you mean? The other child that testified against us. Our other child did not testify against us. Testified He said uh, right. when he got up there, he said that he had seen no abuse. These children have been totally isolated from us for, at that time it was eight months, with no letters, no phone calls, no visitation. That goes with relatives, family, anyone. We tried to get Father Tom Carolyn in to see them, and they wouldn't even let him in to see them. All right, Mrs. Benz, I'd like to continue this, but I'd like to talk to you and, and not have your attorney prompt you here. Um, in, in the testimony, as I understand it, your six-year-old, uh, who did testify, uh, was asked if he would like to return to your and your husband's home, yes. and he said yes. But then when asked uh, by the attorneys if he had been sodomized in the house, he turned to his father and said, but you won't do that to me ever again, will you, Daddy? Uh, that is pretty direct testimony. They asked him if he had been hurt. Now, what do you uh, specify by hurt? Hurt can be spanking. What Do they start these children out and say, okay, 
your mommy and daddy hurt you, when they spanked you, and then they gradually working into uh, hurt, they say, okay, they sexually abused you. These children were not sexually abused. How do you, so, say, how do you say they were brainwashed? They were brainwashed after nine months of seeing nobody. All they see are Scott County detectives, therapists. Uh, they're isolated from all their family and everyone. Why, why doesn't this woman get to at least see her children after she was acquitted? They still won't even let our psychologists see the children. Well, as I understand it, there is a custody hearing, which is still to come, as to whether That's the correct. parents will be able to, uh, to have custody of their children. Yeah. And so that is still to be decided by the court. That's right, but we should at least be able to visit with the children and have our own witnesses visit with these children. They isolate them to the degree where they won't even allow our own psychologist to examine the kids. All right, Mr. Gray, and, and I would ask you to, to be brief because we don't have an yes. awful lot of time here, but I, I want to talk about this question of brainwashing. There are, as I understand it, some 30 or 40 children that have testified to these incidents of child abuse. Are you asking you're wrong, that all you're of wrong. these children have you're, been uh, brainwashed? You're absolutely wrong. Right, give, give me a number. Tell me the number of children that have testified. They have testified? There have been six children that have testified. And a number more have talked to the doctors. A number more. We don't know what they have said because all we have never seen the doctor's reports. All we have seen are Scott County Sheriff Department reports, which are not transcripts of the children's statements. They write down what they say the children said. All right, but the doctors have said, have the testified doctor, that these children have, have told them of child abuse. We have two doctors with us, Dr. Shea sure. and Dr. Levitt, who have talked sure. about that. But they haven't made any objective findings of that child but, abuse. But you are asking us to believe that they have all been brainwashed. No, I didn't say that. I did not say that. And brainwashing is, is a scary term. When a child is taken from a home, as these children have been, and don't understand why they cannot see their parents, and they're told by people, well, you can't see your parents because your parents have sexually abused neighbor children and they have abused you. Do you realize that for six months almost, these children of the Benses never said anything about abuse until finally, after their foster parent dragged it out of them, one child said, if I can talk to my brother, brother I'll say that what you want me to say. Right. That, child said, that child's testimony... Go through extensive evaluation of what that child right. is saying. Dr. Levitt, Dr. Levitt let, me, let me come to you for a moment, because I want to talk to you about justice. I, the critical question, obviously, here is that justice be done, specific, especially for the children, but obviously for the whole town. And I really wonder how you feel that justice can be done. The trials now, apparently, are not going to take place. There is a feeling that the children cannot undergo of the kind of cross-examination, and Mr. Gray is perfectly proper. He is, it is his role to defend his client um, and to defend him as strongly as he can. But how is justice done to the children? Well, I think it's, it's really difficult to, to go back in this whole case and, and say that the best outcome, <coughs> outcome will happen. But I think what has to happen is a decision, are these children safe? Are they safe to go back in their homes? And is each case looked at individually with expert people reviewing those again and looking to see whether any of these children are safe to go home and if any of the, the uh, people have been abused within their own home. I only saw five of the children. It was early in the investigation, so I'm not saying specifically sure. as to who the abusers are, but there is another courtroom. There is the juvenile court where a child can be treated differently and the preponderance of evidence is different. The testimony taken from individuals is somewhat different, and there really can be a much better evaluation of whether or not these children are safe. All right, Dr. Shea, let's give the last word to you. As a psychologist, tell me what is the best way to deal with these children. Is it better to forget about whatever the justice in the case is, to forget about trials and to forget about court cases, and to try, in effect, to work through counseling to get these children back into the home and to, uh, in effect, reestablish the home environment? In our, in our experience, it's very clear that people who sexually abuse children do not spontaneously stop them. They don't stop abusing children until someone stops them. And, and that's the idea of, of the criminal process and, and of the juvenile court process, trying to protect the children and stop this kind of behavior, which is, is so damaging to them lifelong. But there's a real problem with the whole process. And some people feel that the problem is with the helping professions and, and the court process and some people feel that it's the way the defense attorneys are allowed to to really brutalize children during the court process. And and something has to change with the, with the system because the children are suffering and, and there is no justice for the children in this. All right, Dr. Shea, Dr. Levitt, Mr. Gray, and Mrs. Benz, thank you all for being with us. And I'll be back in a moment.